Thank you. It is so great to be here with you. It is really a blessing to hear, be here at Metro Church. I'm sorry Pastor Jeremy couldn't be here with us tonight, but I had a great conversation with him over the phone. I was born in Cuba. I was born under a very oppressive military dictatorship, and as a result, I was involved in a revolution as, as a teenager, was in prison and tortured, but by the grace of God, I was able to leave Cuba and come to the greatest country on the face of the earth. I uh, basically uh, grew up in a very secular family, and uh, as I came to America, even though I became involved in the political process, I really did not come to Christ until my middle 30s. As a matter of fact, I uh, was very, very much enslaved to alcohol, even though I was a very successful businessman. And because of my alcohol, I found myself uh, at the end of 1974, leaving my wife and my son, coming to Houston by myself, and uh, I remember that one man that had sold me a computer invited me to a Bible study at his home. Well, I had nothing better to do, so I went. I have no clue what that Bible study was all about. But what impressed me in that Bible study was that after the Bible study, they had a time of prayer. And uh, all these people were sharing prayer requests. And what impressed me here, all these people had problems. But they had a peace that I couldn't understand. There was a lady that she told that about her son who was on drugs, how he would beat her to get money for drugs. And yet, yet she had this peace. And I just couldn't fathom how she could have peace living in that situation, but it was a peace that I needed in my life. So anyway, as I was leaving, the lady of the house gave me a little booklet. And she said, why don't you uh, take this and, and read it, and could you come back the next Monday? I said, sure. The little booklet was the four spiritual laws. So I came the next Monday. The, next, the first thing this lady said to me is, what did you think of the little book? And I said, well, that's too easy. It can't be that easy. She didn't know how to answer me. She was a new Christian. And instead of referring me to the person that was teaching the Bible study, she said, could you come back tomorrow? Our pastor is going to be at our church tomorrow evening. Can you come at 7 o'clock? I said, sure. Well, I was a scientist. And I spent four hours arguing with this pastor. I had all the answers. Finally, about 11 o'clock, this pastor wouldn't give up. We spent four hours arguing. I remember the last question I asked this pastor. I said, well, let me ask you something, pastor. What about that man up in the mountains of Tibet who's never heard about Jesus? Very wisely that pastor didn't go down that rabbit trail. He looked me in the eye and he said, to tell you the truth, I don't know about that man up in the mountains of Tibet that's never heard about Jesus, but you heard about Jesus. What's your excuse? And it was as if eh, I was hit on the forehead by a sledgehammer and the eyes of my understanding were open and I fell on my knees and received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I had just turned 36 years old. It was April 15th, 1975, on a Tuesday at 11 o'clock at night. Well, uh, the next Sunday I was baptized, and after that I got on a plane and went back to my wife to ask her to forgive me and ask her to come back. She wasn't a Christian, so she couldn't understand, but our son Ted was had just turned four, so... Because of him, she decided that she would come back together with me, and we moved to Houston. And uh, it was very interesting because I had never 
read the Bible in my life. And I was a drunk. So this couple, they gave me a Bible. And they said, uh, begin reading on the gospel, in the Gospel of John. And they marked it where it was because I had no clue. I begin reading in the Gospel of John. And guess what? In John chapter 2, I find Jesus turning water into wine. And I said, well, if it's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. So I continued to drink, but now I was, quote, drinking in moderation because now I was a Christian. Well, to celebrate that we had gotten together, we decided to go to the beach. We were on the, uh, on the beach, we were sitting uh, in, by the beach, and I ordered a beer and I drank a beer. And I ordered a second beer, and I had drank about half of it. And all of a sudden, God changed the taste of that beer. And it wasn't a bad beer because I already drank half of it. But all of a sudden, the taste changed. That beer taste, tasted bitter, horrible. I left that, I left that, uh, that bottle in the, uh, there on the sand. God took the taste and took the desire away. I got home and I had all these bottles of liquor. I poured them all down the drain. I mean, the garbage guy must have thought I had the biggest party because there were all these bottles, <laughs> empty bottles of booze in the garbage. Anyway, that was 40 years ago. And God has been so faithful. I want to share something with you this evening that began with a burden a little over two years ago. I was at a pastor's conference in Ames, Iowa, a little over two years ago, and I heard at that conference statistics that really bothered me. Statistics that had come from a Christian pollster by the name of George Barna. And the statistics said that in the 2012 election, there were 12 million evangelical Christians that had not voted, and another uh, that were not registered to vote, 12 million evangelical Christians that were not registered to vote, and another 26 million that didn't vote. That's a total of 38 million. Well, I went back home really burdened. And uh, in my quiet time with the Lord, the Lord said to me, if I could blame one group of people for what's happening in America today, it would be the pastors. The Lord took me to a passage of scripture that I know very well in Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 17, which says, Son of man, I call you as a watchman on the wall. To do two things, number one, to hear from me, that is to hear from God, and number two, to warn the people. And I felt that I was receiving a mandate from God, and the mandate was, go tell my pastors to go warn my people. Over the last two years, I have done over 80 pastors' conferences all across America, and have brought this message to dozens of churches all over the country. I want to share with you, let's start a PowerPoint. I want to share with you why pastors and Christians in general need to be involved in the civic society. Let's go to the next slide. The Bible says, for no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Next slide. We need to look at this slide from the bottom up. When we are on the foundation of Jesus Christ, can you see the slides? Yes. That foundation begins, of course, with a personal relationship with Christ, the day we surrender our life to Him. And then we begin to walk in accordance with God's commands. We call that in America a Judeo-Christian ethic, and I'll be talking a little more about that in a few minutes. And then the fruit of the Spirit begins to manifest in our life. Love, joy, peace, and the rest of it. Which is really the character of Christ. And then God gives us a purpose in life. Gives us a direction in life. 
we no longer go through life aimlessly. We have a purpose. And I will say, if there is anything that characterizes the life of a Christian more than anything else, is that we live a life of contribution. I don't think there's any higher calling in the Christian life than for us to invest our lives into the lives of others. That's what the Christian life is all about. <clears throat> well, the net result of that lifestyle is a free society with respect to the individual. Next slide. The Bible also says if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? See, the world has set up other foundations. I want to talk to you today about the most prevalent of those foundations, which is secular humanism. Next slide. Secular humanism basically says there is no God. You are your own God. So obviously under that setup, there are no moral absolutes. As a matter of fact, their mantra is, if it feels good, do it. So that lifestyle is characterized by a lot of immorality, a lot of chaos, a lot of problems. One of the challenges we have in America is that secular humanism has crept into a lot of churches across America. And there are many churches across America preaching what I call the social gospel. Trying to look more like the world with the excuse of attracting the world. The problem is, when the world comes, they find nothing different. Because they talk and act just like the world. And those churches lose their impact upon society. Now there's another term that we have been hearing a lot for the last five, six years. And it is the term social justice. I mean, it sounds so good. Who would want social injustice? But what does it mean? What does this terminology, social justice, mean? Where does it come from? Well, I'll tell you where it comes from. Social justice comes right out of Karl Marx. Social justice is collectivism. It is the rights of the group. It denies individual responsibility, which is the biblical context, and instead it divides people into a series of smaller groups and makes each group feel like a victim that needs a handout. So let's think about this for a minute. These people cannot, don't believe in, on, in God, so they cannot rely on God. Individual responsibility is destroyed, so there is no self-reliance. So if they cannot rely on God, and there is no self-reliance, the only thing left is rely upon almighty government. So what it does is it, this social justice creates a dependent society. I think one of the worst things about this state of dependency is that it, that it kills the dream. It destroys the dream. And no longer people believe in the American dream, in the fact that with hard work and perseverance, you can achieve your wildest dreams. That's the greatness of America. But social justice kills the dream. And people feel trapped in a circular treadmill that they can't get out of. The more this dependent society were, uh, grows, the more it is controlled by a totalitarian regime that exerts absolute control of the individual. That is called socialism. Next slide, please. Now, there are a lot of excuses that pastors give for not getting engaged in the civic society. One of those excuses is separation of church and state. Now I'll tell you, I know the Constitution very, very well. I know the Declaration even better. Separation of church and state is not in the Constitution. It is not in the Declaration. 
where does that terminology come from? 